This is a session on bulk fuel facilities and operations in rural Alaska. And I'm Carl with AEA. I'm the moderator, humble position. So we have three presenters for you uh, during this session. We have uh, Mark Smith with uh, Vitus Marine, Nathan Frerich with the United States Coast Guard, and Dennis Whitmer. <clears throat> so we will begin with uh, Mark Smith, and the title of his uh, presentation is The Role of Shoreside Infrastructure. Mark? common theme for many of the uh, questions that I get at uh, energy conferences is why does fuel cost what it does? So over the years I've given a variety of answers to that. There's actually a lot of, a lot of answers. Shoreside infrastructure plays a key role because it's the interface where um, marine cargo reaches the beach. And depending on the location of the port and the size of the village, it actually uh, makes a, a, a big difference. So we'll start out kind of on the ocean side. Um, the biggest, most sophisticated port that we have in the Arctic is the Port of Nome. And uh, these two vessels are off the Port of Nome and that's as close as they can get because the ship on the left is the icebreaker <clears throat> Healy and uh, it draws 29 feet of water and the Coast Guard would prefer that it have about nine feet of water under it and they actually would like it 12. So um, our, uh, our, our most sophisticated deepest water port in the Arctic can't accommodate uh, our smallest and at this time only icebreaker. So here's a picture of the port of Nome in the summer and uh, being in the fuel business I can tell you with some authority that the folks in Nome enjoy the best fuel prices in western Alaska. And the reason is is because you can take an ocean going ship that has loaded anywhere on the Pacific Rim and you can drive that ship to offshore Nome, lighten it up just a bit, and you can go to the Nome dock and discharge your fuel directly into customer tanks. So that is a, a tanker called the Moore, and this is in 2012, and we're delivering fuel to Nome Joint Utilities. So this is the example of the, of the very best and most sophisticated port, and if you look at that port, there's actually not a lot there. So if you're familiar with the lower 48 where you see all manner of terminals and cranes and container ships, that's a sophisticated port. This is actually the best we can do in Alaska at the moment. And uh, of course, my conclusion will be that we can do better. So this is the uh, close to my hometown. This is Dillingham. And Dillingham does have a, a couple docks, a, a city dock and a private dock. This is near the private dock. This is the only uh, location where you can actually load uh, wheeled vehicles on and off. So if you have a barge and you're coming into the shore, you basically have a very unsophisticated area to roll equipment on and off. So again, uh, small equipment only can come in here. It's taking small payloads, and again, when you have small areas, small boats, uh, the cost for all of those moves uh, becomes higher. Okay, I'm trying to go backwards with my... One of the other challenges um, with infrastructure in Alaska is that we're often hampered by our geography and depending on where the town or village is, there's a lot of uh, challenges just getting through to the village. So part of the uh, reaching shoreside infrastructure is sometimes uh, doing dredging. 
there's actually dredging done in Dillingham, not here where the, uh, the bay is highlighted, but uh, closer to the Dillingham Harbor. Most of our locations in western Alaska have a lot of silt, and that silt builds up and moves around. So part of the, port of, part of the uh, aspect of having good infrastructure is making sure that you can aspect it or get to it, and that is uh, sometimes involves dredging. Here is another uh, typical village where you have the challenge of tidal flats. Again, western Alaska is generally a uh, very much a silty plain, and that silt extends out into the water. And when you have tides, you only literally can only get to the beach during certain uh, times of the tide, and in some cases, only in certain tide cycles in the month. So there's a few uh, locations around that, again, to get product to the village, you're limited by a certain uh, narrow windows of time, and that also um, causes your uh, carrier to, to look at this with and charge generally a, some premium to get fuel to your location because it requires a special time window. This is a picture of uh, late fall delivery to good news. And uh, one of the other arguments for actually having port infrastructure is that it actually can extend your season. Um, you can get a lot of shorebound ice if you had a dock that extended a little further into the water. Um, you could get there earlier and you could come there later. And the more uh, time, the larger the time window that you can get to your location, the less inventory is required for you to go over the winter season, etc. less less money to carry capital and fuel. So again, infrastructure has a lot of subtle uh, implications that can save money on the local level. The other aspect of having a very undeveloped set of ports in Alaska is that you're constantly taking your equipment um, into very shallow water. And it's generally not the ocean that causes trouble to sailors, it's the hard part around the edges and we regularly interface with those edges. And we often don't know what's underneath the water, so um, in many occasions, if we haven't been to a port, we'll literally have to take a tide cycle, and in many cases, that's a 24-hour period, just to watch the water go out so that we can observe what the character is of the bottom where we're going to go in and make the delivery on the following tide. And again, with time being money, that's extra time that's being used to deliver to that particular location. So wrap up is that uh, the benefits of ports and infrastructure is enhanced safety, very much time savings. Um, you can enhance competition because if you have a dock that's long enough and big enough, any ship in the world can come to it. And when you have that uh, availability, you get a lot of people that are interested in your business. It's also labor savings. The less labor and time is involved, the less expensive your commodity is when it's dropped off. Also, it's an economic doorway. Uh, the more trade that occurs in any given location is going to provide uh, economic enhancement to the location. So. Um, especially with fisheries and other industries, being able to get product in and out for any local industry is going to be greatly enhanced if you have some sort of port facility. And of course, more economic, more local employment, more jobs, and in my favorite, uh, more fuel consumption. Thank you. Okay, questions afterwards, so open for any, any questions. I obviously did a very good job. Go ahead. Um, what about the double hull fuel barge requirement? When Open 90 was put in place uh, some years ago, uh, industry in Western Alaska lobbied to have an exemption to the double hull requirement. So any 
fuel vessel that is less than 1,500 gross tons is exempt from the double hull requirement. Um, these are single hull vessels here that you see. Uh, the reasoning behind that was that when you go into very uh, small, shallow uh, villages, your double hull will actually take up up to 30% of your payload. And when you have a single hull vessel, you can serve these smaller locations much more economically. Um, it is west of 155 longitude and north, so spoken plainly, it is west of uh, the west end of Kodiak Island, extending up through the Bering Sea coast to the top of uh, the North Slope, and all the inland rivers. These particular vessels were never meant to be ultra shallow draft. Um, these are what we would describe as coastal vessels. Um, to go up the Quijack River, you have a very narrow window of navigation, generally the first week of August, the first week of October. Um, and you need a, a, a tugs and barges that can haul a payload at, at three feet and less. And that requires very specialized equipment. And that equipment is generally only licensable in inland rivers. So for instance, to have a set of equipment that could work on the Quijack, you can't, literally can't take it up and use it on a Kobuk in the same season. So each location that has super shallow draft access really needs local specialized equipment. If any of you ask to charter this piece of equipment, it would be around 15,000 a day plus fuel. So to work that out um, into savings, if I could save a day with that vessel delivering to your village, that I save roughly $15,000. And if I'm delivering 30,000 gallons to your village, I could save 50 cents a gallon. So it's very much driven by, um, by economies of scale and time, obviously. So if I can cut my time down or I can increase my volume, that's what makes good sense for me and what ultimately gives you a lower price. Maybe a follow-up question is, because of some of the risks that you've experienced, your insurance coverage and or the other benefits that you would derive by safer and more efficient operations administratively. Insurance generally covers a, a, a wide variety of risks. Um, the, the region in general uh, pays a high price because there are no improvements. There would be improvements in in my, my economies, and theoretically that would transfer to the customer, but I, I would hesitate to guess what it is on a per gallon basis, but probably insurance specifically would be in less than a cent a gallon. The, the industry has been transitioning over the last five years from essentially a jet fuel that's high sulfur to ultra low sulfur diesel. Um, for us, I think probably less than 5% of our product is jet fuel and we only use it on rare occasions. And so um, I think you're seeing the industry transition almost exclusively over to ultra low sulfur diesel now. And, and again, this year there's actually a product that is ultra low sulfur jet fuel. Um, so we're, we're trying to reduce the number of products that we ship just to give us more flexibility in how we load cargoes. My question is, um, 
where would your response team come from, especially because you're using a single hull? Um, if you happen to have an accident, where is your response team going to come from? Most all of the uh, petroleum carriers in western Alaska have uh, well-trained staff that's actually on the vessel. So as far as I know, all the carriers uh, employ uh, the sailing, the actual sailing crew are all HAZWOPER certified to deal with, with spill response. Um, we have a group of uh, carriers that have an industry uh, connection to a company called Shadow, and Shadow, Shadow basically has teams of uh, people. It has equipment that it can deploy quickly by air to any place in rural Alaska, and that's the uh, primary uh, response group. Just let me tag along a comment there that uh, I lived extensively in both the fishing world and the uh, bulk petroleum transport world. And uh, I don't know that I have the right Coast Guard person here to back me up, but informally about 95% of our uh, oil pollution in Western Alaska comes from the fishing fleet. I'm so lucky that I get to present twice at this conference, so I'm going to make a pitch for the uh, price volatility conference tomorrow at 1.30. Um, the short answer is there's no magic bullets. It really is um, the closer you can move your community to the ocean, the less expensive your fuel and virtually every other commodity will be. Um, the, uh, again, uh, payment, prepayment, not having to take credit risk is a great help. Uh, again, a pitch for tomorrow. We'll have uh, um, we'll have a group from the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation that will talk about what fuel co-opting can do for you as well. Thank you very much. And. Um, I did not properly uh, introduce Mark, so uh, I, will, I will give his background for those of you who do not know him. Um, he is the Chief Executive Officer of Vitus Energy, a third generation Alaska owner of a petroleum distribution business mainly focused on the energy needs of rural Alaska. And he has an executive MBA from the University of Washington. So thanks for uh, speaking, Mark. Our next speaker is uh, Nathan Frerick with the United States Coast Guard. He will be giving us an overview of the Coast Guard Marine Transfer Inspections. <clears throat> and Nathan is, of course, with the Coast Guard out of Sector Anchorage and the Facility Inspection Branch. Good afternoon. My name is Nathan Frerichs. I have 10 years of inspection background with the Coast Guard. I've done inspections in Seattle, four years in New Orleans before I transferred up here this summer. I've had an opportunity to go out to some of the villages and do some inspections out here, and boy, Alaska is different. <laughs> um, so my presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, the real general regulations of the Coast Guard and how it applies to uh, rural Alaska. So first off, the applicability. If your village your facility is capable of transferring to or from a vessel with a total capacity of 250 barrels or more, then you fall into our applicability. Um, 
So 250 barrels, that's the total capacity. So if it's a small fishing boat, that includes lube oil, fuel oil, cargo, anything like that. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to fall into this capacity. Uh, this is for transferring through hose or loading arm over the water. If you fall under that capacity, there's a, and you aren't already being inspected by the Coast Guard, there's three things you need to do. The first thing you need to do is you need to send us a letter of intent. That's basically a letter to notify the Coast Guard that you are a facility and you meet those uh, applicabilities. And very basic informa information, name of the owner, operator, and your geographic location. The next is your operations manual. The operations manual outlines how you as a facility conduct business, how you interface with the vessel and number of people that are going to be uh, part of the operation, if you have communication procedures, all that. I have underneath there the uh, site of the uh, Code of Federal Regulations that outlines the specific requirements for that. And then the third one is your response plan. That's the, if there is a spill, what do you do now? So what we regulate, like I said, if it's coming through a hose from the vessel, that's where uh, you would fall under our regulations. Some of the villages um, are no longer regula regulated by the Coast Guard because they switched to uh, the fuel being delivered by fuel trucks. So even if the fuel truck comes on a barge, if the cargo isn't transferred by hose over the water, then you don't need to do the letter of intent, the response plan, or the operations manual. And we do have a few of our uh, facilities um, deactivated as far as with the Coast Guard uh, because they switched to this type of operation. So in the inspections that I've had an opportunity to do since I've been here, these are a few of the uh, areas of concern that came up most often. Um, the first one, multiple facilities with one tank farm. Now, this isn't actually a deficiency. There's nothing wrong with this. Um, it's an area where I've noticed um, there's room for lots of savings and um, uh, from just a smoother operation. In a lot of the villages that I've went to, there'll be one tank farm that I inspect, and then I'll have four or five different meetings with interested parties who operate a facility out of that one tank farm. Every single one of those facilities each has their own letter of intent, operations manual, and response plan. And if you have one of those plans, you know that they're not an easy thing to generate uh, or to maintain. Um, so one thing that I'm going to be working towards um, as I'm doing inspections in Alaska is trying to help villages consolidate their facilities um, through uses of MOUs or um, just agreements between them so that they have one point of contact, one person they're paying to train instead of three or four different people they're paying to train. Um, really, you could cut the uh, operation cost to about 25% you know, of what it is now um, just by consolidation. The next one is the uh, pressure test for the pipeline. Um, most of the villages that I've been to are using air to test the pipeline. Um, the test required uh, as listed in the CFR there is supposed to be a liquid pressure test. Um, now understand that that's very difficult for a lot of the villages to do. There is an exception where under a written request the captain of the port, my boss, can approve an alternative procedure. So everyone who's doing the air test when you send in your manuals, your application, also include a letter saying that you want to do an air test, how you're going to do it, and then that procedure can then be approved. Uh, the person in charge, a person in charge is the person who has been trained by the facility to be able to interface with the vessel to uh, handle the transfer operation. He's someone who has the HAZWOPER training. He's someone who's trained in the operations manual. He knows how to 
communicate with the vessel. Um, having that person, especially a well-trained person, makes for a much safer transfer operation. And then uh, probably one of the biggest problems that I saw was the containment around the tank farm. A lot of the tank farms that I saw, um, it's usually an earth berm and it's very dilapidated. Usually uh, shore action has started to wash it away, has washed on the containment end up next to the tank and uh, making it so that if there is a spill, oil has a direct path to the water, which is of course what we're all trying to avoid. Um, that's really it. Um, this presentation was really more designed to generate more questions because I want to have more of a question and answer time frame with you guys. Um, so who has questions? Yes. Landlocked tanks such as Sparabon, Pacalina, do you uh, go in and look at that? Do they receive their fuel by barge or ship? Pacalina uh, receives it by barge, and Sparabon receives it by aerial tanker. So by aerial tankers, that wouldn't be Coast Guard jurisdiction. If they receive it by barge, then that would be under Coast Guard jurisdiction. And if you don't have Coast Guard plans, then you should send that letter to this address right here and be in contact with me. Send out their U.S. Air Force radar centers. You go into U.S. Air Force radar centers. Do I? Seven of them West Alaska. Okay, if they're doing overwater transfers of oil or hazardous material to or from a vessel, then that's Coast Guard jurisdiction. Some are and some aren't. I'm just curious if you've ever seen the Coast Guard there. Okay. I've done inspections on Navy facilities. Um, so if, if they're doing that operation, then they enter the Coast Guard's uh, jurisdiction, and then we would be looking at that. This, the village is right next to it. our farm. Okay. Tin City, Pavlina, Sparabon, huge, massive tank farms. That would definitely be something Coast Guard's interested in. Got yeah, about 248,000 okay. each station. Yes. That's not a Coast Guard requirement. So as far as, those are the three big ones. So of course there's other things that when you start getting into the regulations that you'll see that you need, but this is the three big ones. This is where you start from, so yes. So all the villages that have aerial refueling don't have to follow your rules? If it's not going through a hose over the water, then it's not a Coast Guard regulated facility. Any other questions? So if I have a, a fish camp alongside a river and a barge comes along, I can't get fuel from that barge because I have 55 gallon drums. If they give you drums that are full of fuel and just wheel them off the barge and it's not going through a hose over the water, then you would be okay. <laughs> Technically, yes. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. That's capacity of the vessel, not of what you're receiving. If that vessel has a capacity to hold that much, then because you've received that vessel at your facility, that's what makes you applicable. Okay. Our next speaker is Dennis Whitmer.
and he will be talking about diesel fuel additives, use and efficacy for Alaska's diesel generators. A little background on Dennis, he grew up on a small farm, has a degree in physics and another one in materials science and engineering. And after working briefly for a large corporation in a large city, he followed his wife to the lands east of Kotzebue, where he spent five glorious summers looking at birds and tending a small remote hybrid power system. He has spent much of the last 15 years working on lots of things that don't work and probably never will. Uh, to quote Dennis, the longer I work on fuel cells, the more impressed I am with diesel generators. <laughs> so unlike most of the talks he has given in the past, today he gets to talk about something that works. Dennis. Thank you. And actually, David once gave me the nickname Archie DeBunker, so he'll probably show up here. Uh, you'll know when he does. Where's the clicker? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I often forget to thank people. So this time I decided I'm going to acknowledge um, people up front. First of all, thanks to AEA for the funding for this project. Um, ASEP did the project management. Um, Actually, Chandler Kemp, our intern, uh, did a survey of basically everybody he could get a hold of um, in the state of Alaska. He called people up and asked them about fuel additives. Um, and thank you all who participated in that. The response was actually, I think, about 85%. Most people, he was, he was a young kid and worried about calling people cold and all that. And I just said, look, you know, they're either too busy to talk or bored out of their skull and you'll never get them off the phone. So, and I think that was what he found to be true. He's calling them in November, and you know, it's like some of those places I know can be, it's nice to have a new voice on the other end of the phone. So anyway, um, actually the other person too that I've never had the pleasure of meeting in person, but I sure enjoyed the talks that we had with him was Bob Dryden, who um, gave us some of the more uh, useful information that we uncovered in the course of this. And then Andy Lehman is actually a lawyer that works with Bob Dryden uh, to help negotiate some fuel contracts for people. And then also at ASAP, uh, David Light gave some real insight on the way that diesel engines interact with uh, fuel. And then my co-authors in the study, Gwen Holdman, Frank Williams, and Chandler Kemp, who was just uh, a wonderful um, intern or whatever you want to call him. He's now at Stanford University trying to get his master's in energy. The other thing too is I went on the ASEP website trying to find the report and I couldn't get the link to work for me. So I figured this link actually does work. So if um, you go to the ASEP website and you try to search for the full report, it's like a 52 page report and you can't find it. Try to come back to this link and see if you can get it from there. So here's my who's buried in Grant's tomb slide. What is diesel fuel? It's fuel you put in a diesel engine. That's what makes it diesel fuel is you put it in an engine, but it's actually fuel that's designed to run in, in a sustained way in a diesel engine. So heating fuel you put in a heating device, jet fuel you put in a jet. Additive is something that you add to it to change the properties a little bit. I think about it as the lime that you put in your gin and tonic. It's there to add just a little bit extra and change the properties. So, and then I like the one at the bottom here, bunker fuel. In my case, lunch, occasionally with a little eth ethanol additive. I am a firm believer in ethanol, but only for human consumption. <laughs> so what's the difference between heating fuel and diesel fuel? If you look at it, this is essentially a little graph I pulled off the internet. And if you look down towards the middle, down towards the bottom there, you see 450 to 650. They call it distillate fuels. It's both diesel fuel and heating fuel. So when you're at the refinery and you're at that distillation column, diesel fuel and heating fuel are essentially the same mix of molecules that come out of that um, crack. So what is it that makes diesel fuel a diesel fuel? And I covered the first two already. It's a mixture, which if any of you had high school chemistry, if you remember on the first day of high school chemistry, you talked about elements and molecules and pure chemical compounds 
And way down there at the bottom was this funny thing called mixtures, which is basically something that's comprised of many different molecules. And diesel fuel is a mixture. And it contains, I've heard numbers of over 400 different compounds can be in diesel fuel. And they're there in different proportions depending on where the crude oil comes from. So basically what happens is at a refinery, it's just basically like boiling water on the stove. You put your crude oil in there, you heat it up till it boils, and then the fraction that comes out between um, 200 degrees centigrade and 350 centigrade, I think the slide before had it in Fahrenheit just to confuse you, um, that is essentially the molecules that comprise what we call diesel fuel. So, but really diesel fuel that you get is defined not by the crude oil product, but by the NTAR product that you get delivered to you. So what makes it a diesel fuel? Well, it has to work in a diesel engine, right? Kind of a no-brainer. It has to ignite at the right temperature. It has to burn at the right temperature. Now, this is really interesting because in the environmental regulations, what people are worried about is NOx formation. And NOx formation is when you get the air inside the cylinder hot enough to actually burn the nitrogen. The nitrogen combines with the oxygen. So the way that you prevent that is you keep the flame temperature low enough. So the diesel fuel has to be designed so that it catches on fire at the right time, but it doesn't burn too hot so you don't generate NOx. And they also control that with the injection. But it also has to provide cooling and lubrication to the fuel injection system. Um, by definition, it almost has a low flash point. It has to flow at low temperatures for it to be useful. And it has to burn cleanly, which means not too much soot, and you don't want carbon buildup inside your engine either. So how do we know the diesel fuel we buy actually does these things? And the answer is specifications. And the specifications that we use is something called ASTM D975. It's the US legal specification for what makes a diesel fuel. So if you pull up to a pump and put diesel fuel in your diesel truck, by that fuel being in that pump and being delivered to your vehicle, somebody is telling you that that fuel meets all the specifications of ASTM D975. If you're an Alaskan utility and you're writing your own fuel spec directly to a refinery, usually those are based on, on ASTM D975. It'll say AST, or ASTM D975 for all the specifications. We might change a couple of things like pour point. Um, but anyway, that's the way that we know that the fuel that we get is going to work in our engines because our engines are designed to D975 and our fuel is designed to it. So basically, if you match the two things up, it works pretty well. And then even international fuel specifications are similar. Um, the US military buys fuel around the world, a lot of fuel, and basically the, most of the properties that are defined in ASTM D975 are true of many diesel fuels around the world. So it's the job of the refinery and the fuel supplier to make sure that their fuel that they deliver to you meets ASTM 975. It's not the job of the customer to do all the testing. As a matter of fact, if you go look at the ASTM books, the CFR, I don't know what it is. I have a book that's this thick. It's half of the test that you could do on diesel fuel to prove its properties back in 1985. And the reason why I bought that one is because I could buy it on BookFinder for cheap. The new one is twice as thick and several hundred dollars, I think. So anyway, but anyway, so that's essentially, there's a set of specifications. People uh, match their fuels to those specifications. So where do we get into additives? Well, basically what happens is sometimes the diesel fuel, when it comes out of the refinery, for some reason doesn't meet ASTM specs. And so people will put stuff in it to bring it up to spec. Or sometimes people take things out of the diesel fuel, which take it out of spec, which is what happens with ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. Is normal diesel fuel containing the sulfur molecules is adequately lubricated so that you don't need an additive to bring the lubricity into range. But when you take the lubricity, when you take the sulfur out, you take the lubricity out, and so therefore you had to do an additive. So when I talked to Bob Dryden about this, this was a really interesting thing because one of the things Chandler came across where people were a little bit, some people in some villages were a little bit confused about the adding a lubricity additive to the fuel as it came off the barge. 
And what Bob Dryden indicated is the lubricity additives that people use are extremely hygroscopic, which means it pulls water out of the air. And so if you put it in at the refinery, as the fuel is shipped across the ocean, it will be absorbing water the whole time it's there. And so you wind up with more, more water management problems. So what happens is when fuel is delivered, um, it often comes without the lubricity additive in it. And then they add it, they pump it into the fuel as it's delivered at the dock. And so if you're in a village and somebody says, you know, should I put the lubricity additive in? The answer is yes, because it doesn't meet ASTM 975 specs unless it has the additive in it. And if the question is, should I put some extra in it? The answer is no, put in the correct amount because there's no indication that adding addition beyond that is actually beneficial at all. So that was, um, that's what we learned. Oh, and then the other thing too is that when they take the sulfur out, they also tend to reduce the conductivity, but that which is essentially the thing that uh, prevents sparking and ignition from sparking. But they tend to add that additive back at the refinery rather than um, on the dock. And then there's what I call the Alaska necessary additives. Um, if you look in ASTM 975, they actually have three special zones for Alaska, cold, colder, and coldest. And they have pour point specifications based on the lowest typical annual temperature, I think is what it's based on. And so what happens is, um, so in our zones, we're supposed to have fuel that goes to a lower pour point than somebody that lives in Phoenix, Arizona, which makes sense. But um, in order to achieve that low pour point, um, the way that they do it typically is with an additive. But the way that it's specified in the contract is they will specify a fuel that meets a certain pour point, and then the refinery will add the additive to bring the pour point down to where it meets the spec that the, the contract calls for. And so basically, you as a village operator, once again, if you're buying your own fuel, like I know the Western Arctic Fuel Group uh, does a very good job of specifying the pour point they want on their fuels. And so that's part of the contract. And when it gets delivered, it's supposed to meet that specification. If you're a village and you don't know, um, it should be to ASTM 975, so it should be delivered to your village with a, with a pour point specified by ASTM D975. But there are some people who got fuel and it gelled on them and they tried to put a pour point additive in it. What Bob Dryden told us was that the pour point additives that you put in at the village don't work nearly as well and they're not nearly as cheap as adding it at the refinery. Because at the refinery, um, the chemicals react and you can put less of it in and the chemical that you put in to change the pour point at the refinery is a lot cheaper, less than a penny a gallon. So if you're worried about pour point, try to take care of that at your specification level and make sure that the, the place that you're in um, you don't need to uh, worry about it. And then the other thing too is people here generally don't worry about cloud point. And the reason why is because they use day tanks. And cloud point is a problem if you're driving trucks through Minnesota and you have a filter and your fuel comes into the truck really cold into the engine. But here, people tend to warm the fuel before they use it. So therefore the cloud point issue, which is essentially paraffins precipitating in the fuel, don't really matter because they, they use it hot. So additional additives. Um, if the fuel delivered to the customer meets ASTM 9075, does that mean there's no use for any other additives? And the conclusion that we came to in the report was, um, no, fuel, fuel properties can change in storage. And so you might want, if you're storing fuel for a year, you might want to think about additives specifically for that, and I'll get into that a little bit. And then diesel engines sometimes can benefit from additives uh, intended to per, uh, improve their performance, but we'll talk about those specifics in a little bit. So long-term fuel storage issues. The big one is water. No matter what you do, if you have a diesel fuel tank, it's gonna be vented to allow expansion and contraction. Air gets into the tank when it gets cold at night. The water in that small volume of air condenses on the side, it runs down the sides, it forms a puddle on the bottom. And even though in one night there's not very much water that forms on the side, if you let it sit there for a year or two years, eventually you accumulate a puddle of water on the bottom and all kinds of nasty things happen in that puddle at the bottom. 
And the worst one is what they call anaerobic bacteria. They are very good, especially if there's sulfur in the fuel, in combining with uh, the sulfur and forming sulfuric acid, and you can eat a hole in the bottom of your tank. It's um, very nasty stuff. And on top of it, you can actually get the bacteria will form a sludge, and it'll wash into your filters and basically cause havoc. So um, every bulk fuel storage system should have a water management system as part of its operations plan. Basically, a lot of tanks will have taps on the bottom where you can go out there and drain it out until you get clear fuel. Um, I know some operators that they do that once a year just to, just to stay on top of it. But then on top of it, you can also put additives in, and the additives typically are biocides. So basically, if there is something that wants to start growing in the water at the bottom, you try to kill it before it forms that slime that really gunks you up. So, um, so that's one thing that, and actually what Rob Dryden said, he says is that most storage facilities in marine environments in Alaska do tend to use biocides. Um, for long-term storage, and that's completely acceptable. And as a matter of fact, um, that's included as an acceptable additive in ASTM D975. So if you put a, a, a biocide that's intended for that into your fuel, it's not going to hurt your fuel. And if you look at the engine manufacturers, I think we looked at five or so engine manufacturers, and every single one of them has pages devoted to water management in their operations manual for the diesel engine. So this is a well-known problem. Um, people out there know about this. Keep the water out of your fuel as best you can. It's impossible to keep it all out, so pay attention and manage it. Oh, here's an interesting one, too, is when um, here in Fairbanks, I used to every winter put a, you know, a can of heat into my gasoline tank every time I fill it up. And so what happens if I put a can of heat into a diesel tank? And the answer is that isn't something you want to do because um, some diesel engines are extremely intolerant of even very, very small amounts of water. And the way Dave Light explained this to me, the, the fuel injector tips are very, very small. And in some engines, if you get one drop of water in the injector tip and it turns to steam, it will blow your tips off. So um, you got to pay attention to the water that's in there. Um, what methanol does in gasoline is it dissolves the ice crystals that are in your tank into water and that, and that water mixes with the gasoline and flows through your engine. But in diesel fuel what people sometimes do is they actually put additives in deliberately intended to make the water separate out so that you can catch it by another method. But it's not recommended that you put anything in your diesel fuel that allows the water to mix with the fuel like you do in gasoline. So don't put a can of heat in a diesel engine fuel, fuel tank to try and manage the water. That's the wrong way to manage the water. We talked about biocides. Oh, the other thing that happens is they sometimes put corrosion inhibitors in there and stabilizers, which are things designed to prevent the oxidation of fuel. Now, I had a lot of fun um, working with fish oil biodiesel. And the difference between fish oil biodiesel and petroleum diesel this petroleum diesel has been in the ground for about three million years. No, longer than that. Hundreds of millions of years. It's had time to react with everything. It's pretty stable. But a biomaterial like fish oil is actively interacting with the environment and it's chemically much more active. And actually what I learned in dealing with this stuff is that natural fish oil has antioxidants in it. But if you transesterify the fish oil to try and make a biodiesel out of it, you take the antioxidants out of it, and this stuff reacts like boiled linseed oil, which is what we put in paint. So it makes a beautiful layer of varnish so quick. And Dave will tell you, we ruined, what, six engines that one summer on this stuff? It was pretty good. It was 100% effective. We ruined every engine we put it in. So um, that's what you, if, if you're dealing with biofuels, you want, might want to pay attention to, to stabilizers. Um, but I think basically for petroleum-based diesel products, um, I'm not sure of anybody that really uses stabilizers. Other, the military does it sometimes for places where they're intending to store fuel for several years. Okay, so here we, this comes from the report. And um, 
Actually, this kind of summarizes it. These are the things that I talked about. I haven't talked about efficiency booster emissions yet. We'll get to them. Um, but uh, this is in the report. Um, it basically tells you whether ASTM allows something, recommends it, requires it, or whether it just ignores it. And there's a couple of things that they very wisely ignore. Um, and then one of the things, too, is that often you'll see advertisements on TV or whatever for, you know, something to clean your engine out. And those are generally inject injector cleaners. And what's interesting is when you read the engine manufacturer's recommendation, they sometimes recommend them, but they generally say don't put anything into the fuel. And what diesel uh, utility operators were telling us is what they do is they monitor the exhaust temperature. And when their exhaust temperature changes, that means they have a problem in the engine. They shut it down. They pull the injectors. They look at them. So, um, so now we get to Archie's part of the talk, the snake oil additives. And you meet people that claim that they can give you an additive that's going to add, you know, 5, 10, 15, 30 percent fuel economy to your engine, right? And of course, if you can save fuel, you can save a lot of money for the state. There's a lot of incentive to believe in these things. But um, are these claims credible, I think is the polite way of saying it. And let's talk about a, a few varieties of snake oil. Actually, I have tried for years to buy snake oil. Um, because what I heard is that it used to be a compound that when the Chinese immigrants came over to work on the railroads, that they would go in and they would ask for snake oil because in China there was actually a water snake that if you rendered the fat, it was like a liniment that you could put on your muscles and your sore muscles would, would feel better. And so they would go looking to buy snake oil. Of course, we don't have those snakes here in America. So the pharmacist would fill the market with substitutes. And so that's where the term snake oil comes from. And I have tried for years to buy some real snake oil so I could put it in an engine and see what it did. But I was even in China and asked for it. They looked at me like I was nuts. So I have been unable to locate any real snake oil. The only snake oil I know about is fake. So um, anyway, people talk about, um, you read the things on the web, and it's like, OK, we put particles in there. It increases your combustion efficiency. And pretty often, they're things that have platinum or um, they have various brand names for them, but ferrocenes is typically, it's an iron-based compound. And actually, there is a legitimate use for some of these additives. If you have an old gasoline engine that was pre-lead-free engine design, those engines were designed to have lead deposit inside the engine. And ferrocene nicely replaces the lead that isn't there anymore. So if you have a 1955 classic car and you want that engine to run for a while, you might want to put one of these additives in here to replace the lead. But um, in diesel engines, they put metallic particles inside the engine, which don't do a whole lot of good. I've had a lot of fun with um, hydrogen systems. We did some testing at the university. We've published a couple of papers. Uh, basically, we can find no effect of putting hydrogen into an engine other than displacing exactly the amount of diesel fuel that is energy related to the hydrogen you put in. So you can, you can replace one molecule of fuel with an equivalent number of molecules of hydrogen, and you don't lose anything, except you do because the hydrogen is a gas and you have to compress it. So actually, the hydrogen makes the engine minimal, you know, a very, very small amount, but a little bit less efficient than running it on straight diesel. Um, there's magnetic devices have been around forever. And actually, here's one that is really interesting is I heard this, I think this might have been Bob Dryden talking about there are water misting systems where if you inject liquid water into it, the water will evaporate and actually give you a little bit more air molecules. The effect is between 1 and 2 percent. And the reason why people don't do it is because the systems are a pain in the butt to maintain. So there are a few things out there that can give you very, very small incremental improvements in your efficiency, but sometimes at um, a price we don't really want to pay. So the other thing that we found, actually, um, Chandler was really wonderful. He found this great site on EPA site testing of additives for gasoline engines. 
And the EPA started this in 1972. If, you, if you're old enough to remember what happened in 1972, we had our first oil crisis and the price of gasoline shot through the roof. So people come out claiming that they have additives or whatever that can make your engine more efficient. The EPA set up a program to evaluate whether or not these things are true or not. And th when you read the description of what the EPA does to make sure that it's a credible test, I mean, they actually, they have a fleet of identical cars. They have drivers. They randomly change the drivers in the cars. They put the fuel into the tanks at exactly the same temperature every morning. I mean, it's incredible what they do to try and reduce the variability. And then they test enough vehicles so that they can get a statistically different sample. You know, so it's like, is this really true or not? And what has happened, um, they've been operating the, pr oh, and the other thing too is that they give the bill to the person that's trying to, to sell this stuff. So if you're a developer of one of these devices and you think you really have something, you write up a program to the EPA. First of all, they re review all the results that you have so far. And then if you pass that bar, then you get to pay them about half a million dollars to go test your device and see whether it's real. And so far, everybody who's put that money on the table has lost it. There isn't a single device that the EPA shows statistically will provide better economy. So anyway, and a lot of the things that people you know, say, oh, this will work in a gasoline engine, it'll also work in a diesel engine. Well, if the EPA says it works really well, um, I'll believe it. We'll try it in a diesel engine. But that's the first question you should ask a uh, potential additive supplier if he's claiming you're going to get 10 or 20 percent better efficiency is, do you have EPA, have you done the EPA study on this? Well, what they'll tell you is that they're listed on the EPA list of additives. All that the EPA list of additives is like the letter of intent that you were talking about. Somebody wrote a letter to the EPA saying, I intend to sell this stuff. But just because it's on that list does not mean the EPA either approves or disapproves of it. It just means that they know what's in it and at least shaking the can probably won't kill you. But beyond that, um, there's really no guarantee of any of that. So anyway, and the other thing too is you can go to engine manufacturers' websites and these, and these are really straightforward. What they tell you is put ASTM D975 certified fuel into your engine and don't put anything else in it. And then of course they say, uh, and then they'll very specifically say, use no additives. But then they say, if you are going to use additives, here's our great product line. And at a certain level, you know, that seems a little cynical, but I think they can be forgiven because what they're really saying is if you're going to use an additive, we know that we've used these additives in our engines and they do no harm. Because um, some additives that you put in your engine actually can do harm. And that's um, every single engine manufacturer I saw specifically recommended against the use of any additive that creates metallic particles inside the engine. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, they create abrasion inside the engine and so you get much more engine wear out. And the second thing is with the new tier four engines, they will coat the uh, after treatment system. And so basically you don't want anything that's gonna go in there and create metal particles that will build up on your catalytic cleanup system and ruin your engine and then you'd have to call the service tech and all that nightmare that they were talking about yesterday. So um, don't do it. So basically, yeah, diesel engines, model, modern diesel engines are amazingly efficient and clean, especially compared to the diesel engines of 40 years ago. And here's the other thing too, is that one of the things that we learned by testing engines is you can do an energy balance on these engines. And basically, practically all of the fuel that you put in that engine burns and um, either is converted to work, which is what you want, or it's converted to uh, products that come out in the exhaust. And um, they're pretty clean. And really, in terms of unburned hydrocarbons, actually Chandler sat down and looked at this list on, or, you know, the allowed of, uh, amount of the weight of unburned hydrocarbons and soot that you're allowed and that accounts for less than half a percent of the total mass of the fuel. So what that means is if somebody is telling you we're going to burn your fuel cleaner and you're going to get 10 percent more efficiency, there isn't 10 percent more fuel there to burn. 
it just the the engine already is doing a great job of making use of the fuel that went in there so and one of the things too is you find out um, more power can be extracted from the engine if you change the software and apparently in truck stops around the US right now there are bootleg software programs that you can get to um, change the injection timing on your engine so you have better power climbing those hills but as soon as you load it you no longer are within compliance on emission specs and what they're doing is they're increasing the maximum temperature there but you're getting into NOx generation so um, anyway and then here once again if you're a utility and you're watching your exhaust manifold temperatures often you can tell when uh, something is going out of spec. So does this mean that we should never use fuel additives? And once again, I ask good old wise, wise Bob Dryden, you know, do you use additives? And he said, well, you know, I have a boat. And he says, I only use it every couple of months. And he says, I know there's some water that's getting in that fuel. And he says, I do put additives in it. He says, I want to give myself every chance I can of making it home. <laughs> And, uh, and then the other thing, too, is in doing this, you know, I have a Toyota 4Runner, and I wasn't getting the fuel efficiency I thought I should be. I went out and bought a can of engine gasoline treatment at Walmart for 10 bucks, and I put it in there two or three times, and I think my fuel economy improved. I actually keep records, and, you know, something was wrong in my injectors, and it did clean it up. So um basically i think the point is here is that if you're an electric utility and i don't monitor the exhaust manifold temperature of my toyota 4runner so for me the engine goes out of spec and you put a little bit of this stuff in and it, and it helps a little bit but if you're a utility you know probably people are keeping a closer eye on the operation of their engines and see when it drifts out of spec and try to manage things that way so, and then just to summarize what Chandelar came up with, um, he got a great response from people. Um, what we found out too is that most utilities in Alaska are fairly well aware of these issues and um, they're doing a good job. They're burning straight diesel fuel. They're not using additives. Um, a few were confused by the procedures with lubricity additives at the village level. So we thought it was worth making a point of telling people if your barge delivery guy asks you if you want, if you want um, lubricity additives, say yes. And if he ask you to pay for it, say no. And if he asks you if, if you want more, you say no, because that's part of the fuel package that should be delivered for you just to meet the, the diesel specs. And a few have experimented with additives or device to improve en engine efficiency. But when we would talk to them, we would call them up and talk to them and say, well, are you really sure, you know, is this for real? Are you ready to go out and tell everybody in Alaska to, you know, put one of these devices on? The response that we got was interesting. You know, people would say, oh, yeah, we think we saw something. Um, we think we saw a benefit, but we changed engines, and that device doesn't work on our new engines. Or, well, I think I saw something, but, you know, I didn't pay for it. This guy just gave it to me for free, and if he started charging me for it, I think I'd stop using it. So I think most utilities in Alaska already are following the rules here. Um, all that we did in this report was really try to document them and tell people, you know, at, if somebody say they're putting an additive in your diesel fuel, well, that's probably okay. If somebody wants to sell you an additive and it costs, you know, $995 for a 55 gallon drum, I think you're better off keeping your money in your pocket. But, um, a little confusing, but um, really, I think, fairly straightforward. So conclusions, just summarizing. Good additives are ones that are put in diesel fuel to bring it into spec. Um, USDL requires the lubricity additive, usually added at the dock. Um, and then if, you, if you're in a marine climate, you might want to think about a biocide to help you manage that water issue. But the other thing you want to do is to go out there and have a routine maintenance cycle where you get the water out of the fuel. Um, engine manufacturers basically say don't drink anything other than diesel fuel. And there are specific recommendations against putting compounds that contain or create metallic particles inside your engine into a diesel engine. So that's it. Any questions?
Oh, okay. Well, I was wondering about the additive of, of um, used lubricating oils being recycled into the fuel supply. I think that, um, as I understand it, I mean, that was talked about yesterday, and I'm not really up on it. Um, the EPA apparently permits it up to a certain, I think it was 1.75%? 1.5%. 1 and basically what, it, what they're trying to do in the engine oils, we talked about the lubricity being removed from the diesel fuel when you take the sulfur out. Well, of course, the engine oil has to be lubricating. And often there are significant amounts of sulfur in the engine oil. So the reason why the EPA is trying to keep the amount of used oil that you put in, mix in with the diesel fuel, is to make sure that there isn't so much sulfur in there that you create a problem with other parts of the system. But as I understand it, it is approved up to that amount, and people do it because it's a good way to get rid of it. Oh, come on. You're not going to let me off that easy, are you? From... <laughs> <laughs> from your, well, in, like, people talk about this, like, if you're in a town that has a marina, it often would come there, but if you're getting fuel off the barge, um, probably talk to whoever you're buying the fuel from. And, um, you know, my understanding is that um, they're fairly common, and you don't need much of it. You know, it's, you're really treating just the water layer at the bottom. But um, I don't know. I've never bought biocide for a large tank, but... Can you comment on that? Generally, we don't provide it. I don't know if we've ever had a request for it. Okay. It's generally not used in industrial tanks. <coughs> generally, if you have a good ID <coughs> for your tank, you're going to be draining the water out. But sometimes people get into trouble where they do allow the water to accumulate, and then they have to put biocides in, and they have to pump the mud, and it's a mess. I, it, I, yeah. I have a commercial fishing boat. At your marina, if you're at a, yeah, if if you're a boat, if you have a boat, yeah, you go down to the marina, they'll sell it where they sell diesel fuel. If you have a car, they have it at Walmart. Any other questions? Boy, I know everybody's eager to get back to that mid-afternoon snack after what I saw yesterday. <laughs> Are there any uh, questions for any of our speakers in general? Okay, well, you can always. Wait for the Coast Guard. Uh, does the jurisdiction go from the marine header to just the tank farm, per se, and that's, that's it, and the containment, not to any other supply line, say to a school or tank, tank or I mean, a truck? That's pretty much correct. It's from the marine header to the first valve inside of the secondary containment. So inside of the berm. Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you for attending.